Chapter Eight of Kabumpo in Oz. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pam Castile. Kabumpo in Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter Eight Woe in the Emerald City. The soldier with the green whiskers finished his breakfast slowly, combed his beard, pinned on all of his medals, and solemnly issued forth from his little house at the garden gates. "'Forward, march!' snapped the soldier. He had to give himself orders, being the only man, general, or private in the army. And forward march he did. It was his custom to report to Ozma every morning to receive his orders for the day. When he had gone through the little patch of trees that separated his cottage from the palace, the soldier with the green whiskers gave a great leap. Halt! Break ranks! roared the Grand Army of Oz, clutching his beard in terror. Great galoshes! He rubbed his eyes and looked again. Yes, the gorgeous emerald-studded palace had disappeared, leaving not so much as a gold brick to tell where it had stood. Trembling in every knee, the grand army of Oz approached. A great black hole, the exact shape of the palace, yawned at his feet. He took one look down that awful cavity, then shot through the palace gardens like a green comet. Like Paul Revere, he had gone to give the alarm, and Paul Revere himself never made better time. He thumped on windows and banged on doors and dashed through the sleeping city like a whirlwind. In five minutes there was not a man, woman, or child who did not know of the terrible calamity. They rushed to the palace gardens in a panic. Some stared up in the air, others peered down the dark hole. Still others ran about wildly trying to discover some trace of the missing castle. "'What shall we do?' they wailed dismally. "'For to have their lovely little queen and the wizard "'and all the most important people in Oz disappear at once "'was simply terrifying. "'They were a gentle and kindly folk, used to obeying orders, "'and now there was no one to tell them what to do. "'At last Unc Nunky, an old munchkin "'who had taken up residence in the Emerald City, "'pushed through the crowd.' Unk was a man of few words, but a wise old chap for all that, so they made way for him respectfully. First Unk Nunky stroked his beard, then pointing with his long, lean finger toward the south, he snapped out one word, Glinda. Of course, they must tell Glinda. Why had they not thought of it themselves? Glinda would know just what to do and how to do it. Three cheers for Unk Nunky. Glinda, you know, is the good sorceress of Oz, who knows more magic than anyone in the kingdom, but who only practices it for the people's good. Indeed, Glinda and the Wizard of Oz are the only ones permitted to practice magic, for so much harm had come of it that Ozma made a law forbidding sorcery in all of its branches. But even in a fairy country, people did not always obey the laws, and everyone felt that magic was at the bottom of this disaster. So away to fetch Glinda dashed the grand army, his green whiskers streaming behind him. Fortunately, the royal stables had not disappeared with the palace, so the gallant army sprang upon the back of the sawhorse, and without stopping to explain to the other royal beast, bade it carry him to Glinda as fast as it could gallop. Being made of wood with gold-shod feet and magically brought to life, the sawhorse can run faster than any animal in Oz. It never tired or needed food, and when it understood that the palace and its dear little mistress had disappeared, it fairly flew. For the sawhorse loved Ozma with all its sawdust and was devoted as only a wooden beast can be. In an hour they had reached Glinda's shining marble palace in the southern part of the quadling country, and as soon as the lovely sorceress had heard the soldier's story, she hurried to the magic book of records. This is the most valuable book in Oz, and it is kept padlocked with many golden chains to a gold table, for in this great volume appear all the events happening in and out of the world. 
Now, Glinda had been so occupied trying to discover the cause of frowns that she had not referred to the book for several days, and naturally there were many pages to go over. There were hundreds of entries concerning automobile accidents in the United States and elsewhere. These Glinda passed over hurriedly, till she came to three sentences printed in red, for Oz news always appeared in the book in red letters. The first sentence did not seem important. It merely stated that the Prince of Pumperdink was journeying toward the Emerald City. The other two entries seemed serious. Gleg's box of mixed magic has been discovered, said the second, and Rudgido has something on his mind stated the third. Glinda pored over the book for a long time to see whether any more important information would be given, but not another red sentence appeared. With a sigh, Glinda turned to the soldier with the green whiskers. The old gnome king must be mixed up in this, she said anxiously, and as he was last seen in the Emerald City, I will return with you at once." So Glinda and the soldier with the green whiskers flew back to the Emerald City, drawn in Glinda's chariot by swift flying swans, and the little sawhorse trotted back by himself. When they reached the gardens, a great crowd had gathered by the fountain of oblivion, and a tall green grocer was speaking excitedly. "'What is it?' asked Glinda, shuddering, as she passed the dreadful hole where Ozma's lovely palace had once stood." Everyone started explaining at once, so that Glinda was obliged to clap her hands for silence. Footprint! Unc Nunky stood upon his tiptoes and whispered it in Glinda's ear, and when she looked upon where Unc pointed, she saw a huge shallow cave-in that crushed the flower-beds for as far as she could see. Footprint! gasped Glinda in amazement. Uh-huh! Unc Nunky wagged his head determinedly, and then, pulling his hat down over his eyes, spoke his last word on the subject. Giant! A giant footprint! Why, so it is! cried Glinda. What shall we do? cried the frightened inhabitants of the Emerald City, wringing their hands. First, Frine Rudgido, ordered Glinda, suddenly remembering the mysterious entry in the Book of Records. So away to the little cottage hurried the crowd. They searched it from cellar to garret, but of course found no trace of the wicked little gnome. As no one knew about the secret passage in Rudgido's cellar, they never thought of searching underground. Meanwhile, Glinda sank down on one of the golden garden benches and tried to think. The comfortable camel stumbled broken-heartedly across the lawn, and dropping on its knees, begged the sorceress in a tearful voice to save Sir Hocus of Pokes. The camel and the doubtful dromedary had been discovered by the knight on his last adventure, and were deeply attached to him. Soon all the palace pets came, and stood in a dejected row before Glinda. Betsy's mule, Hank, hee-hawing dismally, and the hungry tiger threatening to eat everyone in sight if any harm came to the three little girls. "'I doubt if we'll ever see them again,' groaned the doubtful dromedary, leaning up against a tree. "'Oh, Dowdy, how can you?' wailed the camel, tears streaming down its nose. "'Please, do be quiet,' begged Glinda, "'or I'll forget all the magic I know.' Let me see now. How does one catch a marauding giant who has run off with the castle? On her fingers, Glinda counted up all the giants in the four countries of Oz. No, it could not be an Oz giant. There were none large enough. It must be a giant from some strange country. When the crowd returned with the news that Ruggedo had disappeared, Glinda felt more uneasy still. But hiding her anxiety, she bade the people return to their homes and continue their work and play as usual. Then, promising to return that evening with a plan to save the castle, and charging the soldier with the green whiskers to keep a strict watch in the garden, Glinda stepped into her chariot and flew back to the south. All that day, in her palace in the quadling country, 
Glinda bent over her encyclopedia on giants, and as far into the night the lights burned from her high turret chamber as she consulted book after book of magic. End of chapter 8 Recording by Pam Castile